All right, so we are going to be taking a look at factoring. Now, before we get to that part, let's kind of see where it comes from. Factoring actually comes from foiling, which you've probably done several <coughs> times before. You have a couple sets of parentheses. You want to multiply this out and simplify it. So normally when we do FOIL, we multiply our first terms together. And again, when we're multiplying with variable terms, we add the exponents. So x times 2x would be 2x squared. Okay, not 3x. We're not adding them. We're multiplying. And then I do my outer. x times negative 4 is negative 4x. We do our inner. 3 times 2x is 6x and then we do our last. 3 times negative 4 is negative 12. And not only do I like doing the arrows to make sure that I've covered everything, but it's kind of funny. It just so happens that you get a little smiley face guy if you do it correctly. So once I've got that set, I go ahead, I find my terms that are alike, x squared and x. They both have x's, but they're not the same thing. And when we combine like terms, we're just adding and subtracting. So negative 4 plus 6 is positive 2x, not x squared, minus 12, and I'm done. You're like, well, what's that have to do with factoring? Because what we basically do when we factor is we do this whole process backwards. We go from the trinomial back to my two binomial terms. So we'll kind of start in a little bit easy, at least I hope it is, doing the ones like we were doing yesterday. Again, if there's no number in front of the x squared, what I'm going to do is I'm looking to find two numbers that multiply to get the number on the end and add to get the number in the middle. Now, if you are more visual and you're like, you know what, I'd, I'd like to have the diamond there like we were doing yesterday because it just makes me think about it better. So negative 28 and negative 12. Now, before I start randomly trying to figure out numbers, there's a couple of clues. One of the clues is, since I'm multiplying to get a negative, one of my numbers is going to be negative, one of my numbers is going to be positive. My other clue is, since they're going to add up to a negative, the negative number, when I find my two numbers, is going to be the bigger one of the two. Now, maybe I start thinking about 28, and I'm like, okay, what multiplies to 28 here? Well, I know 4 and 7, and I know 1 and 28, but here's my problem. Neither of those are 12 apart from each other. Uh, I don't know what any other numbers are. I'll skip it. No, just kidding. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead in a case like that, and we're going to take our 28 and I'm going to start dividing it by some smaller numbers to see if I can get a little bit of help. So let's see, 2 went in and 14. Hey, wait a minute. 2 and 14 are 12 apart from each other. That's cool. The negative's the bigger number. Okay. Negative 14 times 2 is negative 28. I owe my friend 14 bucks. I paid 2 back. I only owe 12. Awesome. But... Don't stop because the factoring we said we want to look like the original FOIL problem up above. So my last job is to take whatever your variable's been, in this case it's x, and just write the two numbers in with it that you found in your diamond. Now I'm done. Because if I were to FOIL this back out, I'd get back to the original problem. So again, whether you want to use diamond, if you need to make a little chart, whichever is fine, but we want to make sure our final answer looks like this. Now sometimes I personally think that I don't need a diamond. We'll see if I'm correct here. Two numbers that multiply to four and add up to five. done just like that. Don't even have to worry about it. And honestly, I think we could probably do that again on this next one. Always multiply to get the number on the end, add to get the number in the middle when there's no number in front of x squared. 
two numbers. Multiply to positive 14, add to positive 9. 2 and 7. And again, the order of them doesn't matter. If you put x plus 7, then x plus 2, that's okay. That would work. Now, are they all going to be nice and small and convenient? No. That's just not how this works. So when I get to the last one, let's see if I can get myself any help here. All right, I got x. I see that when I'm multiplying, I'm multiplying to get a negative. So that tells me I'm going to have a negative and a positive. I also notice that the number in the middle that I'm adding to is positive. So the positive number will be bigger. But what if I don't know, you know, this part with 80? I'm like, uh. So let's see here. When in doubt, you start to mess with this a little bit. And again, you don't have to go in order. You could bounce around because you're kind of looking at this and you're like, well, 2 and 40, Hardy, they're not very close to being two apart. These numbers got to be bigger. Let's do like 10. 8 and 10. Hey, they're two apart. Let's try these two. Ooh, the bigger number's got to be positive. All right. But it may, it may take you two, three, four times playing on the calculator before you get that pair of numbers. That's okay. Not a big deal at all. You've just got to keep messing with it until you get there. Okay, but again, that's kind of a review of what we did yesterday. Not all the problems are going to look like that. Okay, so what happens if it doesn't? What happens if I get a number in front of my x squared? What am I supposed to do? Good question. This is where I'm going to bust out my half sheet for a minute. Because I notice when I'm looking at my breakdown, and we'll talk about the first two rules here in a minute, three terms. One, two, three terms. No number in front of x squared? No. Number in front of x squared? Yes. Use slide and divide. You're like, what is that? Sounds like some sort of funky movie or something. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to flip your half sheet over, and on the back of your half sheet, we're going to do number six because I want to be able to do slide and divide, but I want to make sure that it's on your help sheet for later reference. <coughs> so let me copy this down. Bless you, and start to explain where this whole idea of slide and divide comes from. I'm going to take my first number, that number in front of x squared. I'm going to slide it down to the end. Now, here's what slide means in this case. I'm going to multiply the 3 times the 10. So slide the 3 down to the end. Now it looks like the diamond problems that we've been doing because there's no number in front of x squared anymore. This is slick. So I go, okay. So x x. Okay, let's see if I got any hints. Multiplies to a positive, adds to a negative. Hmm. Well, if this is positive, they either both have to be positive or both be negative. That says negative. Okay, so these are both going to be negative. Uh, let's see here. 30. What do I know about 30? Uh, 1 and 30, 5 and 6. Uh, neither of those get me to 17, though. Hey, let's see here. What about, let's start small again. 15 and 2. Ooh, 15 and 2. Okay. 15 and 2 can get me to 17. So I'll write 15 and 2. Now, here's the part that gets people if using this method messes them up at all. A lot of people say, ooh, it's two sets of premises. I'm done. No. Because if I FOIL this out, I'm not going to get this back. There's one more step. We did the slide. We haven't done the divide yet. So now that number we slid before, we divide by each of our numbers that are left. If it goes in nicely, like it does in the second one, just go ahead, reduce the fraction. That part's good. Well, what if it doesn't? What if I hit, you know, 2 divided by 3 and I get 0. 0.66666? Do I write that? No. Once your fraction is reduced, you can swing that back to the front in front of the x and get to the answer. So this is the factored form of this. And the cool thing about slide and divide is it works every time. It's not like you're going to have to go back and guess and check three or four times unless you make a math error somewhere. 
And if I wanted to double check the answer, I could FOIL it out. 3x squared, yes. Negative 15x, negative 2x is negative 17. And negative 2 times negative 5 is 10. All right, check. That's slide and divide. Okay, so you'll always have this example there waiting for you, whether it's on, you know, quiz, test, homework, whatever it is, to be able to practice a little bit with it. But we're going to practice on some more right now anyway on the note sheet. So back to the note sheet. We don't need to do six. We just did it. Okay, seven. Let's try this out a couple more times just to make sure we get it. Slide that two on down. Again, we're multiplying the 2 times the 3. If it's a simple enough one that you can do it without doing a diamond or a chart or anything, I say go for it. Two numbers, multiply to 6 and add to 7. 6 and 1. But again, I'm not quite done. Almost. We're going to divide each of those by 2. And again, if it goes in nice, great. If it doesn't and your fraction is reduced, go ahead and move that back to the front, and I'm set. Okay, so it's really not that terrible of a process unless you get some big numbers you're having to play with. But that's going to happen sometimes too. couple more of these guys. And these guys are as bad as it gets. Nothing in this will get worse than this. There is nothing I can think of that's worse, and this isn't even terrible. So slide. 8 times 9 is 72. I notice right away everything says plus, so that makes my life a little bit easier. But, hmm, 72... 72. I know 9 and 8. I know 1 and 72. Uh, let's see. What else? What else? What else? What else? Um, what about 2? 2 and 36. Yeah, they're still too far apart. Uh, what about 4? 18 and 4. I'm getting closer, but no... Um, what about 6? Because I don't think 5 is going to work. 12 and 6. Ooh, 12 and 6. Okay, sometimes it may take a couple, but we'll get there. So 6 and 12, or 12 and 6. But again, don't stop yet. Divide by the number you slid originally, which causes us one more issue. Some of you would look at this and say, hey, 6 over 8 turns into a decimal. I'm just going to move the 8 back to the front and go about my business. But here's the problem. It's not going to foil out right. So if you're like, well, wait a minute. You said this would work on every problem. It will, but the fraction has to be reduced as far as it can go. Every calculator I know of anymore, even the scientific ones, have a fraction reduce button. So i got to make sure before I do that last slide back with any denominator that the fractions themselves are simplified as much as I can. <coughs> Once they're fully simplified, and I still see their fractions, now I can swing those guys back to the front. And do the same thing on my second one. And I'm a happy camper. Okay. That's the only other twist I can throw at you on these that could possibly mess things up, at least I think. And then I just threw 9 in to make us have to work at it a bit. Sometimes these problems get a little nasty, which is why we have the slide and divide in the calculator. Oh my gosh. 252. It's going to take like half an hour to come up with number 252. Crazy man. All right, let's see if I get any info. Multiply to a negative, I get one of each. Positive in the middle means the plus is going to be bigger. All right. 
Let's play. We need two numbers that are going to be nine apart. Now, again, I'm sitting here going, okay, this is going to take forever at this point. I need to start using bigger numbers. Um, four. That's nah, still not even close. All right, got to get bigger. Um, about eight. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, Twelve. 21. Ooh, 12 and 21. 12 and 21 are 9 apart. Okay. I'm cool. Now, again, if you even went through and did like 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, that's still only going to take like 30 seconds, even if you have to do that. Positive number's the bigger one. Again, don't forget the divide part. Let's move this up a bit. Reduce your fractions. Go to the calculator. If you look at this and go, ooh, three divides into both of those. <coughs> and you want to do that right away. You can. Ooh, six divides into both of these. i got to make sure it's simplified totally. And again, once I simplify it, if it's still fractional, Back to the front, that denominator goes, and I'm ready to go. Again, this is as bad as it gets as far as length of questions go. But once you really look at it, it's really not that much, except maybe having to play with some numbers a little bit, okay? Okay, to the back, where life actually gets easier. When I get to the back, it says sometimes you have to factor out a common monomial first. Break out my half sheet again here. I call this the golden rule. Why? Because it's number one on the list, and this is the first thing you do on every factoring problem you do, every single one. Is there anything in common to factor out? And when I do that, it has to be common in all the terms, not two out of three, okay, all of them. So, for instance, 8t squared and 4t, what do they have in common? t, anything with the numbers? 4. So anything that's in common, variable, number, both, I'm going to go ahead and pull out. Whatever's left over... I'm going to put in a set of parentheses. So it's like doing the distributive property backwards, basically. So it's like, okay, 4 times what is 8? 2. t times what is t squared? I need another t. <coughs> and then, ooh. You, it seems like it would be simple, but maybe not. 4t times what is 4t? 1. Okay, even if it's the exact same thing, I have to put a 1 there to hold the place or it'll disappear. And sometimes that's all I can do. Pull out what they have in common, I'm done. Now, will that happen every time? No. Or I look at a problem like 11, I'm like, oh, I got to slide and divide. Uh, wait. Do all three of those terms have something in common? Yes. They're all divisible by 3. So... Okay, 3 times what is 3x squared? I need the x squared. 3 times what is 6? 2. 3 times what is 24? 8. But this time, what's in the parentheses, I think, is factorable. I'm going to try at least. Maybe it won't be, but I'm going to find out. So let's see here. I got two numbers that multiply to negative 8, so that tells me 1's plus and 1's minus, and add to 2. <coughs> what are a pair of numbers that multiply to 8? <laughs> 2 and 4. So 2 and 4, if I put the 4 here, does that work? Negative 8, 4 minus 2 is 2, it does. So sometimes, even if I factor a common factor out, I may have to factor what's left to get to my answer. And then the final thing, 
You're like, okay, I got this. They have a five in common. That's x squared. Five <coughs> times four is 20. That one's done. Not exactly. You're like, well, wait a minute. This looks different from the other ones because now there's only two terms here instead of three. What's up with that? Well, let me go back to my half sheet again. What size is my polynomial? Two terms. Are they perfect squares? Perfect squares. You know, when you multiply a number by itself and you get an answer. The numbers that I've written right here are all perfect squares. If you ever see those in a problem, more than likely you're going to be able to do something to factor it. So in this case, I make my two sets of parentheses, and I go, okay, what do I square to get the first term? Well, x times x is x squared. What do I square to get the last term? 2 times 2 is 4. But since I'm multiplying to get negative 4, I need one of each sign. And that's called a difference of squares. It doesn't work with plus, only with minus. So I'm like, okay, so that pattern continues here. x squared minus 9. What do I square to get x squared? x. What do I square to get 9? 3. And if you're not familiar with the perfect squares, having them on your sheet or getting familiar with them would be a good idea. And I get my answer. One more of those just to make sure. I'm going to skip 11 and 12 for just a second. Perfect square, perfect square. Again, and it's just what do you square to get each one? I square 2 and x to get 4x squared. I square 5 to get 25 plus minus. Order the plus and minus doesn't matter. And then finally, this last thing is a little, I don't want to call it a trick, but I'm going to call it a trick. You're like, well, couldn't I just do diamonds on these? Yes, yes, you could. But here's the deal. If your first and last terms in a trinomial are perfect squares, there's a shortcut for that. And here's how that one works. What do I square to get my first term? X. What do I square to get my last term? 6. And whatever sign is in the middle, I put in the middle. Boom. You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The 12X just disappeared. Not really. It's still there. You're like, what do you mean it's still there? Okay, X plus 6 squared means there's two of these guys. So if I FOIL this out, x times x is x squared, x times 6 is 6x, 6x, 36, and if I put my like terms together, I get the original problem back. So this works, it just looks weird. You're like, but if I wrote out x plus 6, x plus 6, is that right still? It sure is. So if you forget this or don't decide you don't want to use that and you want to just do a diamond, that's okay. But it is kind of cool that you can just say, hey, x, x is x squared. 4 and 4 is 16. Steal the sign from the middle. Because you may not think using it on a diamond type problem is really that great because it doesn't help that much. Wait till you start getting to problems where you'd have to slide and divide with big numbers and you happen to notice that these are both perfect squares. So you can just say, okay, I square 3 to get 9. I square 4 to get 16. And I just put the plus in the middle. That's kind of slick. Or if you have 49 out here to deal with, who wants to do that? I don't. What do I square to get 49? 7. What do I square to get 1? 1. What's the sign in the middle? Minus. And roll with it. So your job is going to be the book work at the bottom. Monday, like I said, we will do a review of this, have some work time, do some problems together, and then we'll do a mini quiz that day 
after that. So it's important to jump in now, get rolling with this, and do a little trial and error now instead of waiting until a quiz to have.